All right, we have uh, with us a distinguished guest uh, from Southern Methodist University. He's the director of the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom at the Cox School of Business. He is uh, the former chief economist and senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, where he served for 25 years advising the president on monetary and other economic policies. He's the author of numerous op-ed articles for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, USA Today, Financial Times, and Investors Business Daily. And his work has appeared in virtually every major newspaper and magazine worldwide. He's the author of The Myths of Rich and Poor, Why We're Better Off Than We Think. Please welcome Dr. Michael Cox. Thank you, Dale. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. This is probably the fifth time I've been up to uh, Detroit for this event. Um, and I look forward to it every year. Uh, before I get started on my talk today, I want to ask you, do you know who you are? I see you in a certain way. I know who you are. I doubt that you know who you are. Let me explain. When I was in the Soviet Union in 1991, I met a guy who had been a spy for the Soviet Union. And his job was to come to America and find all the dirt he could on this country. Crime, prostitu prostitution, drug addiction, inflation, unemployment. And report it back to his nation for the use of the nightly news, propaganda, really not news. But instead he fell in love with America and he went back and became a counter spy for us. And he and a group of individuals invited me and some other people from the Hoover Institution to come over to the Soviet Union to help finish the job, you might say, in 1991 and bring the nation out of 80-something years of, about 80 years of socialism and, and into free markets. When I met him, his name was Alexander. He lived in Kiev. He had been a philosophy professor and at, in some place in Georgia. And he, we got into... Uh, several really, really interesting discussions, and I've never mo learned more from anybody than I have from him. And he showed me a plan that had been put in place to destroy America that they had come up with. They knew they couldn't defeat us militarily, that they'd have to defeat us some other way, and so they came up with a 10-point plan to destroy America. And when they looked at that plan, they just threw it in the, threw it in the uh, file cabinet because he said, we don't need to do anything. It's already happening. And he pointed to the taking over America's schools, public schools, government schools, by a, a, an ideology of socialism inside the schools. He pointed to the media. Take, the government has to take over the media. The, the left takes over the media. The left takes over the schools. And eventually, he said, you'll get to a generation which is pretty very accepting of socialism. And... Um, they will have more than a plas passing flirtation with it. They'll be seduced by it. And I guarantee you that's your generation. Every nation that's had a downfall has had a generation which took them into it. The Nazi youth and so on are examples. Who are you? You're the ones who are going to stop it. You're the heroes. You're the very few people in a generation who have the common sense and the interest to keep that from happening, to save the nation. If it's not you, it's not anybody. So I want you to know that. That's who you are. Uh, I will regard you a hero if you continue to fight the fight to save this nation. There will be no nation for you, your grandkids, and your kids if you don't stop it. I'm not worried about myself. I'm old enough and have enough money that I can survive and go to another nation. I'm not really not worried about my kids. I have enough money to give them. And, and make them wealthy and enable them to move too, but I am worried about my grandkids and I'm worried about future generations. We're, we're heading very, very quickly down the wrong path <clears throat> and um, your generation is going to be the one that delivers us into that world if you don't stop it. So you're, you are the handful of people who can stop it. Please do. I want to talk about China today and India and America and the global economy of the future. And I'll kind of come back, I will come back to, to what I just talked about at the very end. There's a lot of ignorance around about 
and fear surrounding China. You see it especially in the media. Um, China is presented you know, as a huge uprising new entity in the world. Uh, it's China's century. America has a fear of China, a dragon which we're, from which we're reeling and it's, they're very frightening to us. Uh, if every time we look inside the dragon we see things we don't like. China hegemony, hegemony around the world taking over a lot of assets. China is now the largest holder of U.S. government debt. You can see they own almost no U.S. government debt in, say, 2002, but now they're the largest owner of U.S. government debt. That creates a lot of worry. China's owning America. By the way, this is an interesting chart. I found some data on how foreigners around the wo world hold U.S. financial assets. And foreigners around the world invest in America very differently. If you're from Canada, you're happy with our equities at the other end of the extreme. If you're from Ch China or Japan, you want to own government debt. And they do. And they have gone around the world buying lots of things, such resources, Australian debt. They bought uh, Encanta, a oil company in Ecuador. And this is the, when you have a 50% national savings rate, you, you know, and that's good behavior, by the way. Saving money is good behavior. You eventually come to where you can own a lot of things. And if it's not China, it's India. The dragon versus the tiger, the rise of India, what it means for America. Kiss your cubicle goodbye. Uh, India is coming, and, and they're just not you know, online, and they can do what you do um, in the Silicon Age. Uh, they can, we can outsource our jobs over to cheaper foreign labor. <coughs> Good jobs, computer programming jobs, back office support. India versus China, China versus India. Where are the jobs? outsourcing to these foreign nations scares a lot of people new jobs migration going on software kind of jobs causing Americans who thought that they could get a degree in computer science and be happy forever to be unemployed or accepting much lower wages future of outsourcing uh, this is the night 2003 what you saw is a, a large wage differential between US workers in manufacturing and China and India workers in, weight, in manufacturing. This causes a lot of offshoring, which has helped, helped equalize these, not equalize, but bring these in a, a little bit cl more closer alignment now. But that's, been, that's happened through our wages not going up so much anymore, and theirs coming up, and through the loss of jobs to abroad seeking those lower wages. This creates a lot of angst in people's mind. It, you know, it's not fair trade. Free trade is not fair trade. We should have fair trade, what people say. Um, and free trade just means freedom to exploit people and nature. And there's a lot of fear in people's uh, voice right now over what China and India mean for the world. There's no doubt that China and India will make an enormous difference to the global economy of the future. They're very large. They are, are making a big difference, and the change really still has just begun. Um, if you look at, we, we, none of us would dispute the fact that the rise of Germany and Japan and South Korea eventually changed America's place in the world and, was, and changed the world. Uh, Japan produces a lot of the things that we consume, cars and so on for a long time, Germany too. South Korea decided to join the capitalist club uh, after Japan and Germany and in doing so has raised their income level up and so now these are three, four industrial nations, which um, together are create a different world than if it had just been United States alone. But these three nations, Germany, Japan, and South Korea, are only a total of 260 million people. China and India together are 2.5 billion people, 10 times as many people. So that's the magnitude of the change. You expect 10 times the change because we have 10 times the emerging uh, new partners, trading partners, the emerging new capitalists, and they're joining the capitalist club. As I said, China has, to India together, have a population of 2.5 billion. That compares to America, 310 million, eight times as large as us together. Um, they are growing in a much more rapid rate than the United States. Over this period right here, from 98 to 08, 11 years planning the endpoints, China and India grew at an average rate of 8%. 
we grew at an average rate of 2.7 percent uh, because of things that are happening in the United States this decade uh, have been happening my estimate is this, this growth rate will fall to 1.4 percent whereas theirs will still still stay remain high so every year goes by they're approaching us in terms of their size of their economy so let's look at how in India and China are changing the global uh, economy and I just have time to focus on two basic things supply and demand and then come back and issue a warning for you uh, or a, a just I would yeah it's kind of a warning let me let me but not about these nations about us I'm going to begin with the demand side of this there's a lot of opportunity and it's on both the demand and the supply side and I will try to focus on the demand side uh, on the opportunity in both cases opportunity for us all right so in 1977 only three only one product the washing machine was owned by more than 10 percent of Chinese households they were had still in their last year of communism before they had economic reform a formal communism before they had economic reform the reform came in 78 and they donned capitalism took put on the cloak of capitalism and look what happened to Chinese consumption the Chinese ability to consume in the 30 years after that these are people who were once and for 2,000 years very poor whose income was basically about the same in 1978 as it was in the year one and about five hundred dollars a year and now it's exploded as they enter the capitalist club try a new economic system which provides opportunity to, for them to go work and make stuff for themselves and their family which they get to keep they have property rights over the things they produce now whereas previously it all just went to the state for distribution in the big commune <coughs> excuse me you can see how the washing machine ownership has shot up but apparently they wanted color televisions and a lot of other things too still the Chinese aren't, haven't bought cars yet this is cars five percent that's later to come that's a huge increase <coughs> sorry <coughs> I have horrible allergies this time of year that's a huge increase in consumption and somebody's got to sell them these things and of course or it can be us and it increasingly is foreigners who are selling things to them this is India so China and India you're used to hearing about their exports going up they're shipping a lot of stuff to the rest of the world becoming a dominant export partner but you probably don't hear the good news and that's that they're importing things too from the rest of the world which is an opportunity for an American company to sell them things or American person to get involved in a company or to, to you for you to get uh, to glom on to foreign growth as a source of your having your rising income we are about 1 22nd of the world in the United States population is 7 billion we're 300 million and so we're we're four and a half percent of the world population here in America 21 out of 22 of our potential customers lives outside the United States so this formula for getting ahead in the new world here is to get outside the country find that foreign customer whose income is growing faster than ours and who every year is spending a larger portion of their budget on American products and foreign products and bring the money back home companies that doing that are, are succeeding an example is Apple blue is domestic sales for Apple green is foreign sales if you watch Bollywood movies you'll see a ton of uh, Indian products I mean American products advertised subliminally in their movies you see Starbucks there you'll see Shah Rukh Khan opens up his computer and he's got an Apple computer and got a Nike clothing and so on there he's wearing a um, you know like he's, he's just once dressed out like an American and all and all uh, all ways so I, I watch a lot of I think it's a good idea I think you know if you can find the time these movies last about four hours you should watch a couple of good Bollywood movies just get a ranking of them I'll give you a ranking of them if you want a few of them and you'll see what's going on for a population of people equal to about four times the United States in terms of their love for American products and their consumer behavior Shah Rukh Khan, Ashwira Rai, a former Miss World uh, star in these movies and they get a lot of attention uh, 
there are articles written by economists that talk about um, how product placement and brand endorsement and, and Bollywood flicks is having a huge effect on um, the consumer purchases. Google, all the internet companies are this way in terms of selling a lot of broad Google, Amazon, eBay, Cisco, um, Pfizer, the drug companies, tremendous opportunity. 57% of Pfizer sales in 2010 are foreign compared to 39% just a dozen years ago. Guamanone to the foreign customer whose income is growing faster and who every year has an increased pension for U.S. goods. Uh, that's opportunity, opportunity. Texas Instruments makes all these chips. They go into vice, devices which go around the world. And in the most recent 10K annual report of Texas Instruments, this is up to 90% foreign sales. Kimberly Clark makes, you know, household products and so on, 48% foreign sales, and just up just by eight percentage points in just a decade. Yum Brands is an example of a company I like to point out because they sell Pizza Hut, um, pizza and Kentucky Fried Chicken and A&W Root Beer and Long John Silvers and Taco Bell. That's their five major brands all over the globe. Their foreign sales are up from 24% of total in 1998 to 64%. Um, and they, like I said, they sell these products all over the globe to all the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. They expect to have more restaurants and profits coming out of China than out of um, America. And recently they opened up one of their Taco Bells in India and 2,000 people stood in line the first day to get a taco. And so they've decided to open up 18, um, 1,000 more outlets. By 2015, they already have 2,800 outlets Yum does in, in China. So this is the way to get ahead is notice what's going on. A lot of people with rising income, um, basic stuff. I mean, Colgate toothpaste. Colgate has been looking at the foreign customer for a long time, hoping they would finally get enough money to buy their products. Only about 12% of the people in China and India brush their teeth. Why? Because they don't, they're, you know, don't have good... Um, Hygiene? No, because they don't have money. By the way, if you ever go to Cuba, and I, went, I proposed to my wife in Cuba 10 or so years ago, be sure that you take those little bottles of toothpaste or shampoo or soap. They don't have any. This is that wonderful grand communist experiment that uh, was going to make everybody equal in Cuba and they all are all equally poor except for Castro who has two hundred million dollars the typical Cuban lives on thirty dollars a month they can't afford stuff and um, they don't have toothpaste so here we are now so that but when you get more money you want you know you want the normal things that people want as they get more money such as you know personal care products oral care so let's look at four countries here all Asian countries one more developed than the next, which is more developed than the next, which is more developed than the next. Japan is the most developed, less developed, but still fairly developed with higher incomes, not as high as Japan, is South Korea, then China, then India. This is the percentage growth, not annually, but over the entire five-year time period from 2006 to 2011, the percentage growth in the sales of oral care products such as all the tooth care, everything except an electric toothbrush and uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes and everything. So, yeah, in China, Japan wanted a little bit more, but they've already got them. You know, they've had them for a long time. But if you haven't had them, you want them. And so 70%, 80%, so, yeah, it's about 80% growth in the sales of oral care products in India in one year. Uh, cosmetics, these are mass cosmetics, not the premium cosmetics, uh, but mass cosmetics. Um, India, China on skin care. The record is 407% growth in deodorants in India. And, you know, so there's tremendous amount of opportunity there, which Colgate noted a long time ago, which is why the value of their stock is outstripped that even of their um, peer companies, companies in their same industry, who don't do that foreign thing. 
If you look at the Dow 30, the biggest, the, the, the companies that are in the Dow 30 stocks, what you see is that 46% of those sales in American companies are now coming, being, going, money's coming from a foreign customer as compared to just 35% just a dozen years ago. So that's a formula for success. It can be practiced by anybody anywhere in America. Uh, and you, don't, you can live in Detroit and sell abroad. You can live in Dallas and sell abroad. Out of the 22 areas in which America trades services, we have surpluses in 18 of them. Blue is our export of a service to the rest of the world. Tan is our import of that service from the rest of the world. We do have deficits in accounting. This is the back office work where some U.S. company um, takes the accounting that had been happening in its company and they find a cheaper alternative in India, and that's the tan circle there, us outsourcing our accounting. But some people in the world prefer our accountants, and we insource some of the world's accounting work here. Yes, we have a deficit. We buy more computer services from abroad than we sell, but it's not much. But if you look here, we have huge surpluses in a lot of areas. We, we manage the world's money. Um, we educate the world's population, people coming to America. And when they, every time some foreign student in my class writes a check to SMU, it goes into the blue circle. We advertise for, for companies all over the world. <clears throat> we go around the company, the world, and we uh, do mining work down in, we'll take our, our GPS devices, I'm sorry, our, our uh, 3D underground devices down to Columbia and find oil under the ground. We treat the world's patients who come to our hospitals. We design buildings in Beijing, architecture for the Olympics, and blah, 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 on and on, sell a lot of movies to the world or sports such as the Super Bowl or Oprah Winfrey's programs. We got royalties and license fees on our McDonald's and our Starbucks over there and our movies and other things too. So <coughs> it's not all bad. It's actually much of it is very good. There's lots of opportunity here. Not, so this will allay some of the fear. Now let's go back and look at the supply side. I've told you the lot, there's a lot of opportunity on the demand side. Most of the fear comes from the supply side. And what I want you to leave here with today is how changes in the supply, two things, but one of them is how changes in the supply side affect the personal skills you need to develop in your life. Because what I'm going to show you is that what an employer today in America or anywhere wants from you as an employee is changing tremendously because of China and India. So here's China's output of major industrial products. And I'm going to do a 22, 20, uh, 32 year comparison of 1978 when the reform began to the most recent data available 2010. In 1978, China, this is before, you know, the very beginning of their uh, upward movement to capitalism. That year they made 200 room air conditioners. These are the ones that fit in your window. 200 room air conditioners. Now here 32 years later, 109 million room air conditioners up from 400 washing machines a year to 62.5 million, from a handful of color television to huge numbers. So you see they're getting into everything, and I can show you a lot more data. You can go find this all online at the China Statistical Yearbook, and you can play with it and make charts and graphs. It's right there for you. Uh, China has moved into producing automobiles. Ever seen a Chinese automobile in America? You will one day. They're already the leading automobile producer in the world. So here is the U.S. was the leading automobile producer in the world up until about right here, well, 1971, a lot of them produced right here in Detroit. But as time has gone on, our share of auto production has winnowed down and winnowed down to where now we're sixth, about to be overtaken by India, and China's number one, having surpassed Japan and Germany. So they're making cars for their own self and then for some places in the rest of the world, and they'll... Like, you know, Hyundai, like Korea, Korea with the Hyundai, they'll eventually be exporting a good car to the United States. China wants to be the world's industrial giant, and they're, they are being that. So it's no surprise that manufacturing employment peaked, and the United States, right here, right here on top of China's coming into the world, and ever since then, we've been struggling to hold manufacturing jobs and losing the struggle having lost 8.1 million jobs 
over this 32-year time period. So China is forcing America to be different than it was yesterday, especially in the, in the you know, material, in, in terms of one skill we might have is it be able to bring to the job manual dexterity and motor skills in a machine, in the machine world, in a plant, in a fact, manufacturing factory. India is taking a lot of another kind of job, the back office work, accounting, other things. But as time goes on, the stuff that India first started doing, which is kind of low-level um, formulaic intelligence kind of jobs, code the medical forms, docu image the documents, fill out the tax forms that are just basic tax forms, enter data, that's becoming, uh, things are becoming more sophisticated to where the kind of things they do now is involving slowly, but still it's involving more technical work like animating com uh, computers, I mean more, more analytical stuff like anim animating m movies, e-learning, tutoring. So what, you know, if China's going to take over the manufacturing jobs and India's going to take over a lot of the service jobs, what are Americans supposed to do now? What's left for American work? Well, where do we fit in in the global workforce of the future? Where do you fit in in the global workforce of the future? Well, let's look at, I mean, let me show you three graphs. I'm going to start with agriculture. And what I have on this axis is the percentage of employment in a, in, in a country that is involved in agriculture. And on this axis, I'm going to produce average income in that country. So how does employment in agriculture correlate with income? Well, what you see is that nations who are agricultural nations don't get rich. So you don't get rich, you know, just in, in, by producing agriculture. If you can move people out of agriculture and into manufacturing, this is industry, which is manufacturing, mining, and construction. For a while, you're moving people out of, manuf out of agriculture from the farm to the factory, and for doing so, you're gaining employment in manufacturing on this axis, and your income is going up, income is going up, income is going up. Oh, this is working. And some nations along this path right here say, ah, I see. The way to wealth is to become a manufacturing nation. It's upward slope. And they don't think, they think it's a, what's called a monotonic function, a one direction function. It's not. It keeps going and then it switches direction. You, beyond a certain point, which looks about to be about 30% of the labor force in industry, you cannot increase your wealth as a nation anymore by becoming more industrial. Nations have tried it, they don't go anywhere. The key to continued success means you have to keep climbing the ladder of valuable human talents and go away from jobs at the factory where you're basically moving your hands and your arms and you're using you know, physical skills, coordination, manual dexterity, motor skills, and you're using higher order human talents, human assets. You're getting into the service industry, but not as low level service jobs, but as knowledge service jobs. So here is what happens to a nation's fortunes as they get deeper and deeper into the service industry, more and people employed in services, this is services now, and income is rising. And you see the wealthier nations are the ones that have service jobs. So forget the myth. This, this automatically, you hear somebody come up to you and say, you know, for a nation to be rich, they have to be in manufacturing. No. N no. Up to a point, yes. Beyond that, no. Value is not inherent in matter. It's inherent in the services that matter delivers, and I don't really need the matter. For example, I don't need eyeglasses now that I have LASIK. That's a service. The eyeglasses were matter. If the eyeglasses did not deliver a service in the first, first place, they would not have had value, but I can get the value through LASIK without the material of the glasses. It's the knowledge that's embodied in services, high, knowledge, high value added services that makes a nation rich. I'm not talking about services of cutting hair or you know, painting your house. I'm talking about knowledge-based jobs. So as we move, we have moved from agriculture to industry and now out of industry and then in deeply into services, and this is going to get down to single digits one day, we, this is potentially, it has been a, a way up for America. This is where America works today. Despite the fact that only 1.4 of us work on farms, we have agricultural abundance and fat has replaced starvation as our number one dietary concern. 20% of people total work in the, in the material goods world, 
where they manufacture something or build it or pull it out of the ground like oil or grow, 80% of us work in services. And this shows you that the largest sector is professional and business services, health services, these are doctors and so on. Uh, and you know, now here's the leisure and hospitality industry. We'll, we'll get into the financial industry. Um, I don't want to get, I have three charts here which are a little bit difficult to understand, but what I want to say about them is that um, th this is agriculture. It used, used to be the slice of the economy that was agriculture, with this slice being manufacturing and mining and construction, and this slice being services. Um, so this is the ma places where people use physical skills. Here's where people use mental skills as a school teacher, a telephone operator. A, but, as but these are the kind of mental skills which will make a nation prosper. High education, value-added mental jobs such as being a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, accountant, an engineer, a scientist, a pilot, a professor, a plant manager, a vet, uh, a broker, a truck, even a truck driver can make good money, by the way. These people can make over 60, 60 to 100,000 a year. That's not bad. It's better than a college grad, especially if you get an English major uh, and, or history or philosophy or you know, political science or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of good jobs out here in the world of um, services. So I will think about this. The big change has not been so much what America produces, although certainly that has changed more towards services. The big change has been in the relative value of the assets American workers bring to the workplace, and, or, or I could say it a different way, the big change has been in the relative value of assets American companies look to from their workers. And that's what I want to turn to here next. I want you to think about this. This is the uh, centerpiece of my new book called The Imagination Age, and it's what's after the Information Age in America, and we're already in it. And the centerpiece of my new book is this hierarchy of human assets. In the grand scheme of things, people can be used at work for a lot of different things, and, and, and we have been. There was a time where the most valuable asset a person could have was muscle power. It was about 120, 30 years ago, when if you had a big, strong back and strong arms, you could work on a railroad swinging a sledgehammer and driving in the spikes, or you could work with a pick and a shovel, digging a foundation for a building, putting the dirt in a bucket and hauling it up with a pulley. Big strong people had a lot of, could get paid a lot. But then something happened, and that something was we invented engines and motors. And when we invented those things, uh, we were able to replace human power with machine power. And it was just the economy said to all these people who were, you know, muscled up, hey, <laughs> we don't need that anymore. It debased their skill. But it revalued something else. We need people with manual dexterity and motor skills. People who can operate in the factory and turn this bolt and very dexterous all day long. <coughs> we got a, we got a, a, a digger now, a backhoe, and we need somebody who has a coordination to make those things move so they can dig this hole and put the dirt over there. That's a kind of a low-level intelligence, physical intelligence thing combined. But then the engines and stuff, motors got more sophisticated just to the natural evolution of improvements in capital. Labor complained about jobs in the factory. But my favorite quote of all times is one from Henry Ford, and you can tell what question people ask him, and his response to the question was, well, at least I don't have to deal with the robot union. In other words, unions, uh, cost people a lot of jobs in the factory, and so firms said, okay, I'm not going to pay your this and this, 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 and this. I'll just get a, I'll just get a robot. and we'll, It'll work 24 hours a day, and it won't complain. It won't moonlight. So anyway, so we, we wound up being, you know, losing some of these jobs. People moved from the, front, from the factory floor to the front office. Our new production methods, our mass production methods were efficient. Imagine the big automobile plant, mass production. Now we're making tons of cars, selling tons of cars. We've got to keep up with all the paperwork. We've got to pay the people for whom we bought the parts, collect the money from the people to whom we sold the cars. 
I need you to get in there with your formulaic intelligence, your rote repetitive intelligence. This is, re this is repetitive physical. This is repetitive mental. Open a le ledger, debits and credits, keep up with the stuff. Um, and so you still see this in the economy today in some jobs where people you know, maybe closing houses, lots of paperwork forms to fill out. Formulaic intelligence. I had a guy come up to me yesterday and said, I think I'm going to become a lawyer and I'm going to become a, a I'm gonna, what I want to become is I want to become a, uh, a patent attorney. I said, no, you don't, because that's formulaic intelligence. And, the peop and it's online. And the people in India can do it. And all the patent attorneys I know are suffering because they can't, their wages are not rising anymore because they're competing in the formulaic intelligence area where anybody can, and it's just rep rote repetitive stuff. There's something more important, more valuable than that, another asset of a higher value. So formulaic intelligence was important for clerks and bookkeepers until somebody wrote, until we got computers. And anything that's formulated can be programmed. So now we need analytic reasoning to write the computer program, um, or we need the same thing to diagnose the patient's illness, analytic reasoning. This is the, where the heyday of science, scientific, of science came into the American economy. We glorified IQ as opposed to EQ. We glorified uh, left brain as opposed to right brain, uh, being able to figure stuff out as opposed to get along with folks and motivate them. That day is past. Every time a computer program is written, it substitutes for a lot of thinking. So analytic reasoning is something above that, imagination and creativity. Imagine this new business model we can have. How can we reorganize production to have a global production function, which takes into account the, in, the, the labor in India or so on? Do you know that when you pull into most um, uh, fast food restaurants today, that the first, when you're going down the aisle, that, you know, you, you come in at the first place where there's a sign that tells you all your choices, and you're talking to somebody, where do you think they are? In the building? that you're about to pull up to? No, they're in India or India or Indiana. They're not there. They're in a different, wholly different place where the rooms of these people collected together. They're good at listening and typing, and they're typing in your order and sending it immediately to the kitchen in front of you. And it's cheaper. And that's the creativity to imagine a new business model to take advantage of all the new technologies that, that enable this new business model. That's imagination. This guy did not, he, he, he did, despite the fact he made 800 on the math portion of his SAT test, Bill Gates did not invent Microsoft software. He, uh, it was invented by the guys at Xerox Park who were engineers but didn't have the vision or the imagination to see how much it could be used and would be wanted by people. He saw it, he imagined a world where people would use it as, composed, uh, as opposed to those old way of using computers which none of you ever saw, which is just a blank screen with a few lines on it you have to type in. You have to read the computer manual to even use it. He said, that's not good. People can't, not everybody can be a computer programmer, but everybody would like to have a, a computer. And here's the device that enables this, the GUI software of the, of the you know, icons on your screen. He bought it for 250000 He brought it to us because he had the vision and the imagination to know what it would do. This guy did not and, and he, he, this guy imagined a world where pe Jeff Bezos, where people could get books not from a bookstore, but through this wide river of books available at first out of his apartment in the West Coast. He was driving, by the way, f he had lost his job in New York, and he was driving from the east to the west with his wife. And along the way, with no cell phone to play with, nothing to distract him, no nothing to but time to think and sanctuary, they dreamt up this whole idea of Amazon. They had time to think about it. Michael Dell, imagine a way you could get a computer without having to go to a computer store, build it yourself online. The Google guys, imagine a new way to, to search, a new, new kind of search engine. <clears throat> Let's do some imagination here. What is this? It's PVC pipe, right? What's it used for? Plumbing, toilets, it's, it's the big pipes, drains and toilets. Can you imagine a more lucrative use of this pipe, where you can make m good money with this pipe? The guys in Blue, Blue Man certainly do, and they have one heck of a show that they put on 
where they play trombones with it and they, and they, and they beat a drum and people just go crazy because this is, they imagine an amazing amount of stuff and you'll pay $100 a seat and the audience is full of $100 a seat people to see their imagination run wild and kind of a beautiful celebration of what the human mind can dream up. This are somebody, doctors, who have, who have created a way where you can get robotic surgery. For a doctor that's 5,000 miles away, doctors in New York operating on patients in Strasbourg, Germany. And even it goes up to open heart surgery <coughs> online with new technologies. Imagine a new way to be a doctor for the world. Uh, this woman is uh, at TudorVista.com, and this is an American company run by an American guy who employs Indian PhD and master level scientist, master's level scientists in mathematics and engineering and so on to tutor American students at home in their students' bedroom for $100 a month, all the tutoring you need. TutorVista.com, imagine a new business model. You just go in there and you look at it, and somebody in India will be doing the homework for somebody in America uh, <clears throat> run by a U.S. company. Creativity. Uh, do we want to be manufacturing the Barbie doll? That leaves China for about a dollar. But it sells in the U.S. market for well over ten dollars, and what really gets the money is the, is the molds, the design, the marketing, and all the other things. But all, you know, m almost no money is in the doll in China. So they're not really adding much value, and so they can't be making much money from the doll. We're the ones making the money off of it. Now here's what your generation seems to like to create. And by the way, this number is now up to 500,000 apps off of cell phones, off for, for your iPhone or your Android, or now the Samsung is the most popular phone in the world. Apps for just about everything. Um, and I'm always hearing new ones. Um, I heard a really, I can't remember, I'm trying to think of a new one I heard yesterday. It's like, I can't believe this. It's really cool. Um, and people who do these things, the average development cost from an app is about thirty to 40000 And if you happen to get a good one, like, you know, um, Ghost Finder, then you can, for a dollar or two, you sell it to, it's just a gag, to a million people, uh, and that's good money. What's the important thing to have if you're going to be able to contribute this high value thing in your life? Imagination and creativity. Well, you need to be able to think. And you cannot think if you're being interrupted all the time. I am so glad that it's not a fad for my generation, I hope it's a fad for yours, to always have to have our iPhone turned on or our cell phone turned and constantly paying attention to, to things people are sending me. It is annoying to have that much connection with the world because you can't get away and think. Some of my best thoughts come when I completely divorce myself from the rest of the world and don't let myself have an opportunity to be interrupted. You cannot think deeply if there's a potential to be interrupted because it's painful to be ripped out of deep thought. And so if you're going to be creative, you've got to remove yourself for some period of the day or life from others and give yourself time to think. Above that even though are people skills and emotional intelligence. Think about who's in charge at most companies and what skill they're using. Are they sitting down there and are they using their, well, any of these? No. They might be analytical, but they have to motivate the entire labor force of the company, make you feel happy about who you are, what you're doing, good about yourself, make you feel, I'm not even working. I just love this place and I, and I can't stop doing these things for this company. And I'm working for Southwest Airlines and my boss is Herb Kelleher and he's the neatest guy in the world. We just love him. Emotional intelligence. It's not IQ, it's EQ. Um, at the top of every corporate pyramid is somebody who understands people really well. And this is an undeveloped skill in America. It's not taught in our schools. It's taught in life. And you should try to be good at this. Get good at this. Um, at the top of every corporate pyramid, where people make a lot of money, are typically people who are really good with people, uh, with a lot of emotional intelligence. And we work for them. And they have a gift. If, if they're, usually if they're going to stay in that job, they have a gift. I think one of, the, one of the things I would tell you about, and I especially tell you this because I'm a kind of a, I wouldn't say I'm a moody person, but I'm a, I'm a, I do wake up in a different mood every day. Every day is like a fine wine. 
which is a function of how much sleep I got the night before, did I exercise, and things like that. Uh, first step to being a good manager and uh, being good with people is to be aware of your own moods. What mood am I in today? Um, and manage them. If you're in a bad mood, don't go into the office and bite people's heads off. Don't go into work and, and create a scene. You can do more damage in five minutes than you can make up for in a year. The way to do that is to manage your moods. Use, I use things to manage my mood and put myself in a better mood. Exercise, hard exercise is one of those things. Another thing I use is music. I can create any mood I want with music. I can want to kill people if I watch, listen to gangster rap or some of that. I hate that trashy music. Or if I listen to maybe salsa or merengue or something from Latin America that's got a heck of a good beat. I used to have a rock band growing up and so I'm fairly sophisticated musically. If it's complicated music, I like it. And so um, I can use those things to manage my mood. I suggest you do the same thing. Having a sense of humor is not inappropriate uh, humor, but humor is good at work. People love being around somebody who's funny or makes them feel good. People skills. A little different than emotional intelligence. A large percentage of our workers are employed in services. So we're already way ahead of the competition in terms of our exposure to working with other people on the job. If you're, if you're in the industrial age, you're working with the, bro with, uh, sorry, or, or the agricultural age, you're working with broccoli or with a, a VCR on the assembly line. You don't really have to have a good relationship with the person because you're not dealing with them. But we are in the services age, 80% of us work in services, so we have several laps on the field already in terms of us being better at services than other nations. And if you've traveled the globe, like I have, you know that. You can go down to, my wife, like I said, is from Ecuador. We go down to Latin America, and it's appalling how bad a service you get because it just tends to be part of Latin American culture that you don't serve people because it's beneath, it, 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 it places you beneath them and at your feet. And, at their feet and that's, and you know, I'm not going to get at their feet. In America though, the customer is always right. You have it your way. Service to others is not seen as demeaning or belittling. And because it's not seen that way, we'll, 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 we'll bow down to the customer, which means we can be successful in the world market. Also, we're a, cre we're a melting pot, a nation of diverse cultures and races and so on. It's good that we are all mixed up like this because this gives us the exposure to and ability to manage people of all different races and cultures and, and that's um, what we need because the world is that way. Uh, we are the world. America is the world uh, and we sh we have, this is a, something we should celebrate and not denigrate and it's um, something that is an asset for us. Now let me ask you this. I've told you about the hierarchy of human talents. Assets I mean. But can you think of anything that's more valuable, asset, human asset, that you want to make sure you have, and you, you seek it and you never give it up? You never lose it. What's more valuable? Very close. This guy still has muscle power. He still has manual dexterity and motor skills. He still can be anal he can still be all these other things. What did he lose? His reputation, his character, his image, his brand, the Tiger Woods brand, $22 million, same, same thing, Lance Armstrong, what did he lose? His reputation, his integrity, how much? $100 million, wow. So, uh, reputation, good name. Your character, your image, your brand. If you look at the history of America, companies today can. I can. Pete, you go, you'll buy Heinz ketchup all day long. You don't question up Heinz ketchup when you pick it up at the grocery store, or Yale Locks, or all these vacuum cleaners with people's. Ever all these products that you buy in the branding of America, you don't question those things, because they've taken the time and the care to build a reputation which they did not sacrifice. These people sacrificed it. Trying to get a little bit more money, they lost it all. One of them is, they spend time in prison. This guy killed himself, I think. 
I'm not sure. He's gone. Uh, this guy is in prison. This is Ken Lay. They lost it all for a few bucks. You read the pick up the, the Wall Street Journal today and read about this traitor. This, what is this traitor? Traitor for uh, uh, KPMG. For a few thousand dollars, he was doing inside trading and lost his reputation. Money has its price. If there's anything I've learned in life is that money has its price. But reputations are priceless. Some people think that they can, you know, kind of sell their reputation and get a little bit for it. You can't do that. It only, trying to do so only costs you. In fact, I think you're in the generation where more than ever companies are looking for honest people because they're relatively hard to find. And not only will you not have to sacrifice by being honest in your life, you'll get paid for it. You'll get generously rewarded for it because that's what we need. There's so many dishonest characters, even inside American companies today, and, but in politics and everywhere. So maintain your integrity at all costs, no matter what. Remember, it's only, it's only money. It's not you. you. You can't lose this way. Now, I'm going to close by switching, I'm going to kind of switch, not switch subjects, but just kind of put a final twist on this. I've given you an understanding of what's happening here in the world with China and India, and it's not bad, it's good, we just need to change once more time, upgrade our human assets and work at the top of it and not the bottom. These are better jobs anyway, and, and we'll get paid for that. So you have an understanding, that should allay some of the fear and the ignorance uh, surrounding all this outsourcing things, which scares people. But it's been a very tumultuous time for America, America as these two giant nations enter the world economy and outsourcing and jobs. And we have the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now we have the worst slump since the, um, that we've ever had following a recession. Even following the Great Depression, this, it was not, we had a much faster rebound than, than this. There's still all this angst going on, and m much of it centers on the uh, re reorientation of the world to allow these big new peop uh, trading partners to come in. And so the result of it has been a lot of not just fear, but a lot of uh, discrediting of capitalism, the, pro the capitalist process. And capitalism is getting trashed in the media and by politicians, greedy capitalists um, and, you know, crony capitalism. People like to attach these words to the word capitalism to try to discredit capitalism. I have a whole other lecture on how that's nonsense. There's no more, you'll never find more greed in, than you will in American uh, pol politicians. Or, I mean, it's enormous. Or even in the Soviet Union, where I saw the people at the top were most greedy, and that wasn't capitalism. But anyway, I want to make, point out what's at stake here in America's fight to remain a capitalist nation. Because we're not remaining one right now. It's slipping away from us. What's at stake? Well, first let's look at Greece. Greece has become probably the greatest socialist democratic state, dem democratic socialist state in, in Europe. Greece is, you know, even the rest of the Europeans look down on the Greeks for their insistence on living the high life at the expense of other people. Greece is a nation where the majority of people finally got to the point where they just want to seek to live at the expense of others. And they found the politicians who would give them what they want, and the politicians will take the Greek bonds to the world market, sell them, take the money, and instead of taxing the Greek citizens to give them what they want, they'll just take the money that they sell from these bonds worldwide and buy stuff for the populace and promise, I'm going to promise you this. No, I'll promise you this. I'll promise you this. And whoever promises me the most, I get elected. And so they're running up huge debt, and, you know, they're... This is a path to socialism across a different path, democratic socialism, where, like I said, you, have, you, you achieve a socialist state through the majority of the people seeking to live at the expense of others and being belligerent about it. America is not that far behind in, our, um, in terms of you know, occupying Wall Street, saying that capitalism has failed us, it's failed the 99%, that it only benefits richest, rich people in the world. This is in a part of Houston called um, River Oaks, which is a wealthy part of Houston where this fellow lives. And there's a lot of people who put these kind of t-shirts on today, or they wear t-shirts of Che Guevara as if they're here, the socialist killer, 
He's their hero. There's no doubt that capitalism is good at producing wealth for many people. In fact, each circle here represents billionaires of a certain number of, I'm sorry, um, approximate value of, of the wealth in these areas from 1 billion to 40 billion. And you can see we have wealthy cities with wealthy people in them, Bill Gates and so on. America produces a lot of wealth and wealthy people. Capitalism is good at producing wealth, and that's all some people see. But the truth is, capitalism is even better at eliminating poverty for nearly all. Capitalism is society's greatest welfare program, greatest anti-poverty program. These are the richest people in the world. Every person here signifies a million, um, a million people who live in the top 1%. So these are the world's top 1%. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, 20, 26, 52. 52 million people in the top 1% of income earners. Now, some people aren't working, so you can't count them, the babies and stuff. 52 million. Where do they live? The blue ones live in America. Nearly half of them. Did you make $34,000 last year? Just $34,000? If you, congratulations, you're in the top 1% of American income earners. Uh, I'm of the world, top 1% of the world's richest population. The true global middle class falls far short of owning a home, having a car and a driveway, saving for retirement, and sending their kids to college. They live on just $1,225 a year. Most of them don't get to enjoy capitalism, and because of that, they're extremely poor. My cab driver on the way in from the airport here was from um, Croatia. The one I had in Dallas was from Eritrea. And they all, they all came here to be a part of this capitalist experiment, which is wonderful, and has served them well. And in their nations, there's warlords and dictators and everything else, and nothing works to raise living standards like capitalism. That's how great it works. Now, as a first approximation, inside America, the income distribution is nothing more than an education and an experience distribution. High school dropouts don't make good money. And here they are. If you get a college degree and you're, say, 45 to 50-year-old, you make multiples of what a high school dropout would. Master's degree, you make more. PhD, you make more. A professional degree, like a lawyer, doctor, or something more. Education is the proximate cause of, in, of the distribution of education is the proximate cause of the distribution of income. But this is not the only variable that determines income in the world, because I can show you education in a lot of different countries. Let me do that. On this axis, let me put the number of years of schooling that people have in a country average number of years of schooling, and on this axis I will put the consumption level of the people in that same country. The, con the dots in green are countries which are economically free, in the top 25 percent of the most economically free countries in the world. The countries in gold are in the bottom 25 percent of the most economically free, in the, world, the least economically free, and the blue are the 50 percent in the middle. What you notice is that education pays, but it pays a whole lot more where there's economic freedom. If you take this data set and you apply standard statistical methods called econometrics, which you learn in grad school, really easy stuff, and we say, okay, the dependent variable is consumption. And I'm going to say consumption depends on schooling, S, and freedom, F, your level of freedom from 1, which is very low, to 10, which is high, or your schooling from no years to 12 point 13, which is 12.4 is the United States. You run the regression and you fit this. You get back the following coefficients on schooling and freedom with very th What this says, by the way, is that we're 100% sure that these coefficients are extremely important, that these variables are extremely important. In fact, they explain 70% of all the variation in consumption around the world. 70% of all the variation in consumption around the world can be explained by the variation in schooling around the people have 
and the economic freedom those people have. Let's suppose that with that equation we go back and we look at the United States and we hold cost in our schooling. We keep us at 12.4 years of schooling, but we just lower our economic freedom so we can see how sensitive our living standards are to the level of economic freedom. I'm going to put us in Cuba. I'm going to take all my students with their fancy finance degrees at SMU and I'm, who keep thinking, that oh, I can make, you. you know what, why are you making a living? Because you're getting an education, but you're in America too. Let's take away your freedom, and I'm going to lower the freedom score from what the United States had this year to what Cuba had, and here's what happens. Our $3,300 a year in consumption would only be $3,800 a year if we were practicing our trades and our, the fields that we graduated in in a socialist nation or in a communist nation. So that's how much difference it makes. It makes about nine-tenths of, of what you uh, of what you earn is, is the system itself. Yes, you do matter in the course of what you're doing, but the one thing that also matters very much is, is capitalism. So that's your job. That's what you're here for. You're the hero. I'm asking you to do this one simple thing. Help save capitalism. 